Hello, hello, good morning, Cybrarians. Welcome back to day two of our SISM certification course. My name is Kelly Handerhan, and I am excited to be here. Thanks to those of you who are patient this morning, got a little bit of a delay, which is appropriate because we had an unforeseen risk. And what are we talking about today? Risk management. So we're starting a little bit late just so I could illustrate impact of risks, right? Certainly wasn't a technical problem or anything like that. So I do appreciate you being patient. Like I said, this is a, a, a new venture for us. So we're still working out some kinks, but hopefully you're finding good value from what we're doing and that you'll be patient with us here. And uh, we're, I think we're on to something really good. So yesterday, we talked about the first domain of SISM, which was governance. And we talked a little bit about corporate governance, but then said, really, our focus is going to be on information security governance. So what we're looking from from our government, or what we're looking for from our governing bodies is we want them to take information from our stakeholders. Now, our stakeholders, our customers, our board of directors, um, shareholders, employees, all the people that are impacted by the work of the organization. And we take those shareholders and stakeholders information and their needs and we turn them in or they governing entities turn them into business goals and objectives. And like I said, those goals and objectives tend to be pretty broad. They're also strategically focused, meaning it's not what we want to do tomorrow that governance is concerned with. The governing entities look at where we want to be three years out, four years out, five years out, you know, somewhere in that range and say, OK, big picture. Here's where we see ourselves strategically in five years. So we're looking at things like increasing our share in the market or improving transparency or customer recognition or customer confidence, you know, those sort of very broad goals. And then they break those goals down into business objectives. Objectives help us accomplish our goal. So if our goal is to improve customer confidence, governance may say, OK, one of the objectives that will help us get there would be to become CMMI certified or certified with ISO 27001 or any of the other frameworks and certification industry uh, entities that we talked about yesterday. So it's their job to choose those broad goals, objectives, and then here in information security, our job is to figure out information security uh, controls and really an entire program that will satisfy the goals that senior leadership set out. Now, again, we focused on governance. So we focused big picture. We said we're going to take those goals and objectives from senior leadership and we're going to create a roadmap and a strategy that will help us get there. That's still in line with the governing entities, right? So, like I said, if we have a business goal of increasing profit, then our information security goals are going to focus more on availability and ease of use. If we want to increase security, then our goals may be around confidentiality or integrity, perhaps. But the bottom line is, and especially for the, well, I don't even say especially, but for the exam and in the world, we always start with the business. There's never security just for the sake of security. It is always security in such a way that best benefits the business. Right. And the business is our customer. We talked about that a lot yesterday. And we said, you know, from an organizational perspective, when we're talking about um, what we do in information security, we go to the data owner and that data owner is the line of business. So if it's, you know, sales data, we go to the head of sales or if it's production data, we go to the production. And at any rate, what we're looking for is to determine how best to protect it. Now that's going to require that the data owner has a means of being able to determine the value of their asset, as in they need to be able to look at requirements across confidentiality, integrity, and availability, figure out what the requirements are, and that's going to give us a value. Now it's going to give us a qualitative value, low, medium, and high. It's not a dollar amount, but it's still a way of categorizing data. And with each category, we have a certain set of security controls. So what do we do? We identify and determine the value for the asset. 
then we apply the appropriate security controls for each category. And that's where risk management and developing the security program is going to come in, right? All this blends together, and it's not really a one, two, three, four set of steps. There's a lot of integration across these domains. So what we're going to focus on today is really the life cycle of risk management. And hopefully by the time that we're done today, you'll get a good understanding of how risk management plays into senior leadership's decisions for what the goals and objectives and how they oversee and what they're monitoring for and those kind of ideas. Risk management plays directly into that and risk management's gonna drive what our security program is because with our security program, what we're really ultimately trying to do is to mitigate risks to a degree that's acceptable. So risk management's gonna drive the security program, which is domain three, that's tomorrow. That's your cliffhanger for tomorrow. Make sure you come back for the information security program. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into risk management. And I do wanna stress in case anybody was not here yesterday, um, if you would, uh, I just wanna remind you that we offer you the opportunity to ask questions at any time you have them. I personally, as an instructor, love questions because that keeps class interesting. It's not just me going blah, blah, blah all the time. So if you have any questions, throw them in uh, to, uh, you know, add them to the chat, whatever medium you're using, and those will be passed along to me and I will try to get to everyone's questions. So I really welcome questions. I'm excited we're doing this live. I'm glad that we have a good audience. So jump in there with your questions at any point in time. All right, so we are gonna start with domain two today. And like I said, if you're new each day, we're gonna cover one domain of SISM. Generally takes between three and four hours, depending on the material. I try to take a break every hour so that nobody collapses over uh, from lecture fatigue. And uh, that's kind of the platform we're going with, same as yesterday. So we're gonna talk about domain two. Remember, risk management as a domain is 20% of the exam, all right? So, you know, um, you'll probably have about 30 questions on risk management, but risk management should play into your decisions. So sometimes it's a risk management question that doesn't have the word risk in it. So, you know, always your security decision should be founded or based in good understanding, a good understanding of risk management. All right, so what are we going to talk about? Well, I'm going to go through and give you some definitions of risk. And one of the things I find is sometimes people use the risk definitions um, in a non-standardized way. They may use threat and vulnerability interchangeably or risk appetite versus risk tolerance versus risk threshold and all those. So we're going to go through and just do some definitions right off the bat so you'll know what I'm talking about when I use a particular word. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about bias. I've got a few extra slides on bias, but I don't want to bog you down with that. We mentioned it yesterday. I'm just going to reiterate that again. I'm going to hint towards developing a risk management program, but not going to spend a ton of time in that because that's what we do tomorrow. We're also going to look at a couple of risk management frameworks. We'll talk about responding to risks some of the tools we have, and then how we communicate and how we continue to monitor risks. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. That's what we're doing today. And so, like I said, I'm going to just start off right off the board. And some of these may be basic to you, but um, let's just make sure we're all on the same page. All right. So when we talk about a risk, a risk is usually considered to be an asset, a threat, and vulnerability together. Where those three meet, there's your risk. So the asset is something I value, and it can be tangible, like hardware. It can be intangible, like, you know, customer reputation. So regardless, if it's something that's important to me, it's an asset, and we need to identify it and figure out its value. It may not always be a quantitative value, but we do need to determine its value. All right, so an asset, something that's worth something to us. 
vulnerability. Where do we have a weakness, a lack of protection around the asset? Okay. Um, the vulnerabilities can be inherent or they can be due to the way they're installed. It's still a vulnerability. So that's our weakness. And then the threat is something that's going to bring harm to the asset. So you have to have something that you value. There has to be a weakness and a threat to exploit that weakness. Because when the threat does cause harm to the asset, we call that an exploit. Um, now, that's a risk, asset times threat times vulnerability. But generally, and we'll talk about this more, the next thing that we want to do is we want to get a value for the risk. What's my loss potential? Because I'm not going to spend $50 to prevent losing 20 Right. So I got to figure out what the loss potential is. So to figure that out generally, now this is this isn't an in deep college level course on risk management. This is from an information security management perspective. It's still high level. But when it comes right down to it, the loss potential comes from the prop the probability of the risk happening and the impact if it does, the severity. So we've got probability, which could also show up as likelihood, and we've got impact or severity. So if I have an 80% probability, I'm going to lose $10,000, and we're looking at an $8,000 risk. Now that's really important to know because that's going to dictate how much money I'm willing to spend to prevent that loss. So if I have an $8,000 risk, I might spend $5,000 not to lose that amount. I'm not going to spend 10. All right. Now, like we said, the definition of risk, probability and impact uh, are how we value it. But to determine or identify our risks, assets, threats and vulnerabilities. Now, one thing about a risk, a risk is always unknown. That's a defining characteristic of a risk. Once the risk event happens, then it's an incident. Okay, so um, there's not a risk of rain yesterday. It either rained or it didn't. If it rained, that was a weather incident. And if not, it just didn't happen. Okay, so I put that down there because I think that's something that might show up on the test. Uh, you know, just kind of generally speaking, might be uh, how, you know, they might focus in on the fact that a risk is always in the future. Okay, so those are uh, just some sort of basic definitions. We'll get a little bit more advanced with the definitions as we move to this next slide. So inherent risk. Life is full of inherent risks. There are just some risks that exist getting out of bed especially if you're my age, those inherent risks increase. So an inherent risk is just, it's just the fact that anything you undertake has a certain amount of risk. Now, what I have to do is identify those risks and determine if they're acceptable. All right. So the risk that I'm going to be a little achy in the morning, I'm going to accept that risk because it's not terrible right now. I can live with it. Another risk in my house of getting out of bed in the morning is I'm going to step on a Lego. I actually, at this age, have two small kids at home. I know I'm too old too, but I do. And random Legos, and I don't know if any of you guys know what Beyblades are. These are even worse to step on than Legos. That risk is not acceptable because when I step on those things, it hurts. So what do I do? I add a control. In the evening, my policies before bed, I do a scan of my floor to see if there's anything sharp I'm going to step on that's going to make me yell. And that's called a control. It's a policy or a process control. Right? So my controls are ways that I mitigate risk. So if my inherent risk is okay, I can live with it, we call that risk acceptance. If that inherent risk is too high, then I'm going to implement some sort of control. Now, here's the thing. All right, so my mitigating control for stepping on sharp things on my carpet that shouldn't be there is I have a process in the evening to scan my floor. But isn't it true? I also have two dogs, and one of my dogs loves to bring things up and chew them. So even though I have a process for scanning my floor in the evening, it's possible well, there's still a certain amount of risk left. 
my dog could bring a Lego up and chew it on the floor. And because I'm only scanning at night, I don't catch it. So the idea is when I add a control, usually controls don't totally eliminate risk. Risk elimination is rarely our goal. Now you can avoid certain risks, but usually we think of mitigating or reducing the risk amount. So I had an inherent risk of stepping on pointy things that was too high. So I implemented a control or a process and what's left over is residual risk. There are other ways sharp things could appear on my floor. So then I look at what's residual and I say, oh, that's still too high. Well, then I implement a, another control. Maybe I vacuum every morning. That's never going to happen. Um, and if that's too much risk left over, I implement another control and another control and another control. But ultimately, at some point in time, my residual risk gets to a point where I say, I can live with that. Right now, again, my inherent risk gets mitigated until the residual risk is acceptable. That's a really important idea. And you can really say that risk management is all about reducing residual risk to an acceptable degree, because once that risk falls in the category of what's acceptable, I don't need to spend any more money. I don't need to add any more processes. I accept the risk where it is. Now, who's going to tell me what's acceptable? Well, senior leadership is going to provide us guidance with that through determining our risk appetite. And then we're going to look at individual risks to get a risk tolerance. OK, so um, let me just mention something. There's also the possibility of a second risk. Before I get to risk appetite and risk tolerance, I do want to mention secondary risk. So secondary risk. Sometimes you fix one problem just to cause another. That is the story of my life. Fix one problem, now that's caused another problem. That's called a secondary risk. So for instance, patching a system. There's a possibility if I run a patch on a system that it might cause that system to continuously reboot or to fail to function properly. That's a secondary risk. So when I am dealing with risks and planning on risk responses, I also have to look at secondary risks and determine if they are acceptable. And if not, I need to reduce them as well. Sometimes we take shortcuts. Sometimes we just fix the immediate problem at hand. And we're off to the races. We're off to happy hour at five o'clock, right? We have to think about the decisions that we make. One of the worst examples of secondary risk I can think of is, um, after the events of September 11th, obviously huge tragedy, um, one of the responses that we had in the States was that we fortified the cockpit doors on planes so that they couldn't be compromised. Now, that was a good strategy for reducing the risks that attackers or terrorists would compromise the cockpit door. The only problem with that was uh, there was a flight in France, uh, Grenoble, France is where the, the plane crashed, but a co-pilot waited for the pilot to step out of the cockpit and then he locked the door and fortified it so that no one else could get in. And he was obviously very mentally ill and intentionally crashed the plane. Horrific incident. But what we did is we fixed one problem, but then it created another. You make it so the bad guys can't get in, well, then the good guys can't get in either. So sometimes we don't play that out far enough to think about, OK, I've done this, but what else is it going to open up? So secondary risks we got to identify as well. One other name that a secondary risk might go by is a control risk. The idea that any control you put in place may introduce new risk. I put a firewall in place to mitigate the risk of external attacks. But if I don't configure that properly, legitimate traffic can't get through or it's going to slow traffic down potentially. So when we're identifying risk and determining solutions, we always want to think about uh, we always want to think about the down the line risks. Okay. Bear with me just one second. Got a little issue with my uh, 
my headset here. I hope you guys have been able to hear me. If you haven't been able to hear me, I've been brilliant up to this point. You really missed a treat, but I, I'm assuming you can. You guys have been able to hear me. Let me just make a quick switch. I'm hoping that's a little bit better. A little better sound quality, perhaps. There we have it. Okay. So, been talking about risks. Just to pick up, we talked about inherent, residual, and secondary. So, now in shifting to talk about risk appetite. So, senior leadership is going to determine the risk appetite for an organization. Usually, there's an organizational appetite, if you will. So, a company that has really high value assets may be very risk averse. For instance, organizations that handle financial data and financial transactions, um, organizations like hospitals where human life is at stake, military operations, certain operations have a very low risk appetite because of what they stand to lose. So an organization might be risk averse. Now on the flip side of that, sometimes we have these young startup companies that have financial backing and they have a lot of financial backing, so they're a little more risk seeking because nothing ventured, nothing gained. The whole reason we undertake risks is because we stand to gain from them, right? That's the risk utility. So I might have a higher uh, or a risk seeking appetite if the risk utility is high and the value of my assets are low. Now, there's also risk neutral, where I don't chase after risks, but I don't run from them either, and I evaluate risks kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's where a lot of organizations operate. But senior leadership is going to drive our philosophy on risk, how we approach it, you know, our general risk attitude, if you will, our risk appetite. Now, risk tolerance tends to be for specific risks or specific types of risk, and that may be opposite or in alignment, can be opposite or in alignment of risk appetite. So I may be risk seeking, but for certain types of risk, I'm less resistant to take on uh, a risk, maybe because of its risk utility or, or whatever that may be. Now, risk profile, how, what is my exposure to risk? So obviously, uh, within an organization, I want to operate within, I want my risk profile to stay within our risk appetite. So I don't want to be exposed to all sorts of risks if my risk appetite is risk averse. Talk about this more in just a little bit. All right. I also have a risk threshold. So there are certain values that I may not exceed. And I may have kind of a cutoff point. All right, I'm willing to risk up to $10,000, but no more. That's my risk threshold. All right, and then we have a risk capacity. How much risk can we take on as an organization before we become unviable or we risk our volatility, our, vi uh, the, our viability? Okay, and then controls are what we put in place in order to minimize risks and manage them, reduce those risks to a degree that's acceptable. All right, let me give you an example of some of these. Um, I love to play poker, love poker. I grew up playing poker and once Texas Hold'em became popular, love that game. From time to time, I like to go to a casino and play a little poker. I also love the slots. I love the roulette wheel. I just like being in a casino with lots of noises and bright flashing lights. You know, it's like uh, overload of the senses, but I love it. All right. Now, and nobody call Gamblers Anonymous. I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't go that often, but when I do go, I go to play. You're not going to see me as one of those little old ladies putting pennies in the slot machine going, I hope I win a nickel. No, man, I come to play. Go big or stay home. 
All right. So I have a risk seeking appetite. Why? Because the risk utility is high. One of these days, I'm going to bring home bank, right? There's the potential for huge gain. Now, I should look at probability and impact of that, but we'll talk about that later. All right. So I'm risk seeking. But when I walk in the door of any casino, the very first thing you see any casino on the planet by the doors, slot machines. You know why? Because slot machines have a lousy uh, payoff. So I have a low risk tolerance for slot machines. I'm risk seeking in a casino, but my tolerance is very low for slot machines. As a matter of fact, I'm going to spend 25 bucks on the slots. And if I don't win, I'm out. That's my risk threshold. Risk seeking appetite, low risk tolerance for slots with a threshold of 25 bucks. Okay. Now, I also, before going in, have to know what my risk capacity is. I'm not going to go in and wind up trying to mortgage my house. And if you've ever been to Vegas or to casino, all of a sudden things that wouldn't make sense outside start to make sense. Maybe I can withdraw a few more hundred bucks because I'm on a roll or I could be on a roll. I just need some luck, right? My risk capacity when I go to a casino is maybe 300 bucks, okay? To that, I can just count as a, a, a night out. I can live with that as long as I don't go too often. If I start to exceed that, now I'm threatening my viability. I am making it so maybe my car payment will be late or Maybe it's not that bad, but you get the, the picture. So my risk capacity, I need to determine. And throughout the course of the evening, I'm looking at my risk profile. How much exposure to risk do I currently have? Am I trying to bet on the horses, put $80 in the slots, play some money on roulettes? That's not going to work. So I have to make sure that I'm proactive about monitoring to make sure my profile's within my capacity. Because once it's not, now I'm threatening my viability. Translation, if I go home, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble if I lose more than 300 bucks at the casino. Okay. Now, one of the things that's not on this slide, one of the things I do try to go do when I go to the casino is I try to diversify my risks. I don't put it all on red at the roulette wheel. I might uh, risk a little money at roulette, a little at Texas Hold'em. I might play um, a different type of poker. I might play slots. So I spread my money around. I don't think I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to put it all on one particular game within the casino. And then the controls I put in place, like I said, I periodically review and determine how much money have I spent. Another control, I might leave my wallet out in my car so that I don't keep dipping into it and start thinking I can take money out of the ATM. I will tell you this because a friend told me to do that. She was like, just leave your wallet out in the car and that way you won't spend any more money. And I said, but I know where I parked my car. I can walk out to the garage and get that wallet. Luckily, I haven't done that. I don't generally do that. So hopefully that helps you understand the differences because a lot of these words kind of sound alike and it doesn't help that so many folks use them interchangeably or misuse them. But these are the definitions for my SACA. So I want you to have those. And when you uh, if you're on the exam, if you see a question about risk appetite, I want you to know that difference between tolerance and between threshold. All right. So those are your risk definitions. Now, um, there are some different types of risks. I also want to mention systemic risk. Now, when you ever hear um, a risk described or an organization or an entity described as too big to fail, that means you have systemic risk. The financial markets, the airlines, the automobile industries. And the idea is, okay, we may not, we might allow allow General Motors to fail, but if we do, then auto parts suppliers, mechanics, um, 
all the stores in the region that sell things related to automobiles, right? It has that kind of trickle down effect and it takes out more than that just individual organization. It's going to affect an entire industry or economic segment. So that's systemic risks. We really have to be aware of those. And, you know, again, those may be above our price grade or above our pay grade, but those are the ones that have the farthest and the wide, most widespreading impact. Now, contagious risks. I don't know if you guys remember, but before the 2016 election, hang on. Before the 2016 election, there was an attack that took Amazon and Facebook and Twitter and, and several of the major players offline for a period of time. Now, it would have to be a massive attack to take Amazon offline, but Amazon and Twitter and Facebook and Google, like it was huge. But what actually happened is Amazon was never under attack. Facebook was never under attack. Twitter was never under attack. What the attackers targeted were the DNS servers that provided name resolution for Amazon and Google and so on. So the idea is they uh, the name of the company that did the DNS, they were named, uh, they were called Dime, they still are. Um, so by attacking the DNS servers, that made it so that anybody that wanted to connect to, you know, these uh, websites by name couldn't do so. So it was a contagious risk. The risk started with DNS, but it wound up affecting other players as well. And that was a very smart type of attack. One of the things we'll talk about tomorrow with our security program is how important it is, how important DNS is in our world. It is the root of all good and evil. All right. Uh, another type of risk is called an obscure risk. Obscure risks are those things, they're sometimes called unknown unknowns because they're just off our radar. It's something that I just wouldn't even consider. So when I'm doing my risk management, I'm thinking of those things that are likely to happen. You know, if you ask me to identify some risks on a network computer, I'm going to say malware. I'm going to say um, uh, user error. I'm going to say unpatched software and all these different things create risks on network computers. Now, is it possible that, you know, there is some new type of attack that exploits a weakness we've never seen before? Is there something that could happen totally off my radar? Sure, but it's not something I personally have experienced before, so I don't even consider it. Um, with the September 11th attacks, Donald Rumsfeld, at the, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time, said these attacks were unknown unknowns. And what he was really trying to say is, we never dreamt that terrorists would use airplanes to target buildings. Now, whether or not it really should have been an unknown unknown, you know, we could go way down. We're not, we're not going into that. That was his point was that, hey, we never saw this coming, so we didn't have an adequate strategy in place. And that happens a lot with these obscure risks. So what do we do? Well, we make sure that we have good visibility of the systems we're protecting, meaning we monitor them. And not only do we monitor them for known uh, activity, known malicious activity, but we also monitor just to make sure they're performing as expected, that our baseline performance stays consistent. You know, if I've got 25% processor utilization day after day after day after day after day. And then on Thursday, processor utilization is at 89%. Well, I may not know exactly what's happening, but because I know my system, I know something's happening that needs to be investigated. So the idea is that system has to be visible. I have to be watching it. But and I also have to be able to recognize that something out of the norm is happening. So visibility and recognition are really the ways that we do our best to respond to obscure risks. Things can still happen, but we're doing our best. Now, these obscure risks are sometimes called black swan events. 
because as everybody knows, swans are white. All swans are white. There's no other color of bird that would class be classified as a swan other than a white swan. Swans are white. Oops. What's that? Well, apparently swans can be black too. Who knew? That's how these risks happen. Hey, we got everything covered. We're prepared. We're good to go. What? Something shows up that was unexpected. COVID, for many people, many organizations and businesses, was a black swan event. If you go back to December 31st, 2019, how many of you had global pandemic on your bingo card? Because I certainly did. And many organizations were caught off guard because we had planned for fire. We planned for hurricane and flood and, you know, malicious attacks and all these other things. But global pandemic came out of the blue. I mean, not really, but that's kind of how it felt. So it left us scrambling. Who were the folks that recovered or were able to keep moving? Folks that had good disaster recovery and business continuity plans that were generic enough to catch whatever came, okay? So I may not have had a specific plan for a global pandemic, but I did have an alternate means of operations. I did have money put away. I did have additional resources, right? So, you know, risk management can also lead or can will also, of course, influence disaster recovery and business continuity. And it all goes together. All right. How are we doing? Just want to check in with everybody, see if everything's making sense, if uh, the definitions seem good. If anybody wants to go to the casino with me in a couple of weeks, I'm in. Just want to make sure we're doing okay and you guys have plenty of time to ask questions if you'd like, if you need to. All right. Well, I am going to move on. I'm going to trust that you guys will let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Now, we talked about bias yesterday, and I have several uh, slides on this, and I, I'm not even sure if that's large enough for you to see it. For the test, you don't need this. However, I find it interesting to look at all the ways that our brain tricks us into thinking one thing or another. Let me tell you, um, one of the, um, uh, you know, if we're going back to talking about gamblers, uh, gambling, there's something called the gambler's fallacy. And I'll tell you, I fall prey to that. To Thinos, if you go to a roulette machine, a uh, roulette wheel, there will almost assuredly be a little screen that shows you what the ball landed on the last 10 rolls. Okay, so if I go up the roulette wheel and I see it's been red the last 10 times, what am I going to bet on? You know I'm going to bet on black. But every roll of the ball is statistically independent. I flip a coin 10 times. It lands on heads every single time. What's it going to land on the next? Well, 50% chance heads, 50% tail. So there's that fallacy of, hey, I'm due, right? Things good are going to happen. But there's also anchoring, which is kind of that idea that the first quote maybe you hear on a product or the first estimate of a duration is what you continue to go back to. Whatever you hear first tends to stand out the most and be sort of like the point by which you measure others. I'm not going to read all of these. And like I said, if you see questions on bias on the exam, they're really more around things like what bias is, how they can negatively impact us, how we can avoid making decisions based on bias. And we talked about that yesterday, right? There are ways that we make decisions that aren't based in logic or, or not rational decisions. The best way to mitigate the impact of bias on our decisions is to look for bias in our decisions. 
Nothing worse than me saying, I'm unbiased, I'm totally fair. No, I'm not. You know, even if I think I am and strive to be, we all have bias that's built in. So what we need to do is surround ourselves with different people of varying backgrounds and experience. We need to be willing to hear if someone calls out our bias or someone presents a different view. That's a critical element of being a good manager, not just an information security manager, but any type of manager. As a matter of fact, for those of you that have taken PMP or are thinking about taking the project management professional, that's an important part that we talk about in that class too, just how to avoid bias. So. There are a handful of uh, just different types of bias. Some of these are really interesting because as I went through, you know, I could see, I could think of all these examples in my real life, right? That confirmation bias of where I only ask people that I know are going to tell me yes. So I can say, see, everybody thinks I'm right and all sorts of uh, other forms of bias. So I don't want to spend any time going any deeper. I do. Um, uh, I find it a fascinating topic. It does come up more on the C-RISC certification exam, but I don't think you're really going to see a lot of questions on types of bias on the CISM exam. All right. Now, our next piece as we move into, we're going to look at developing a risk management program. So what we're trying to do is to find a way that we can integrate risk management into our enterprise, right? Um, how we're going to evaluate risks, how we're going to define our assets and determine the value for them, how we are going to respond and monitor. So part of this risk management program, we've got some work to do. So the first thing that you do really in project or program management is you get the context. What environment am I working in? If I'm in the military, that's a very different context than if I'm at a bank, than if I'm at a grocery store or whatever that may be. So what's the context of the organization we're working in? Any risk management framework, any risk management methodology is always going to allow a little bit of customization based on your organization. So we always have to step back. This could come up on the exam as understand the business. What is the first thing you need to do before diving into risk management? Figure out the business. What's important to the business? What are our goals and objectives so that we can make sure we're in alignment? That shows up on the exam, that concept, a lot of times. And the reason it shows up on the exam a lot of times is we need to make sure that we understand what we do in information security is support the business. No more, no less. All right, what's the scope? How far reaching is this risk management? Am I looking at risk management, uh, managing risks for a system, an application, a department? We define that. All right, um, often developing this program, or really developing this project program should be managed as a project. So we get authorization from leadership, which comes in the form of a project charter. And in that charter, we define the structure of the project, how we're going to report, what we're tracking. And then this big bullet point, or this bullet point here at number four, so important. How we identify assets, how they're classified, and then who owns them. A classification strategy or a classification policy is critical in information security. We have to have a way to evaluate systems, determine their value, and apply appropriate controls. And that's a big part of our risk management program is to figure out what controls will mitigate the appropriate level based on certain risks. Okay, and I'm not going to read, you know, objectives and methodologies, you know, what we're trying to accomplish and what's our approach. And then we get our project management team together. Just a quick note, if you are in information security management and haven't had any type of formal project management training, I can't stress enough that it will help you. Project management training, I think, will benefit most anybody as far as um, 
you know, regardless of what you're doing at some point in time, we almost, almost all of us wind up managing projects. Now they may not be officially called projects or we may not have project management on our business cards, but I do think that uh, understanding how projects are managed is, is a way to really improve how you manage and work with others. Okay. All right, now within roles and responsibilities, in relation to risk, we generally think about an organizational uh, structure that has three lines of defense. Okay, so the first line are the business units. So the individual lines of business. We generally think that the, you know, we generally consider these to be our risk, um, our uh, data owners. So these are the folks that work with the data day to day. They determine the risk mitigation strategy, they manage, they monitor the risk mitigation strategy to ensure that it's effective. Okay, so the individual lines of business, meaning the data owners that determine the risk response, the right ways to mitigate risks. But we also have to have risk governance in place that sets the foundation and says, this is the amount of risk we're willing to tolerate for these types of risk. Here's our risk appetite. They provide the framework and the methodologies that we're going to use to mitigate risk. That's our second line of defense. And we would think of those, you know, of course, in risk governance. We also have a third line of defense, which is our audit, our information assurance that guarantees that the policies and procedures set out by governance being followed by the business units, the data owners, and to make sure that it's working. Right. So those are our three lines of defense and those, those should be baked in to organizational enterprise risk management. All right, now I think that is a splendid spot to take a short break. Uh, like I said, I try to take a break every hour so that you don't get lecture fatigue. You get a chance to stand up and get some coffee, move around a little bit. So we are going to take a break now. It is 11.56 my time. So if you will be back at 12.05, please return at 12.05. We will pick back up and we will talk about some other responsibilities from governance all the way down to management. All right. Have a great break. We'll see you in just a few. 12 
righty. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. And we've been talking about risk and uh, the ways we, we're leading up to talking about how we identify risk, how we determine what we stand to lose, how we mitigate risks accordingly, and then how we continue to monitor and respond to risks. That really is the risk management life cycle. But up to now, we've just kind of laid down the groundwork. We've talked about some risk definitions and ideas like what makes a risk, where an asset, threat, and vulnerability come together. Um, we've talked about uh, the idea of probability times impact, helping us identify the risk value. We've talked about risk appetite and risk tolerance. And again, just gotten some of those definitions out of the way. So now we're going to pick up with responsibilities in relation to risk. We've already talked about the three lines of defense for risk. The first line being the actual business units or data owners. Then we have the entities responsible with risk governance. And then our third line of defense is audit. Now that leads us up to looking at some, some specific risk roles. I think these may show up, so they don't get really deep into it. We also understand that in reality, not every organization addresses risk, uh, has the same hierarchy. So some of these roles you may not have within your company. That's okay. This is just kind of a, a, a high level definition of some of these roles. So if we talk about the chief risk officer, they are responsible for the risks of the enterprise. And typically they're not IT focused. So they're not looking at IT risks except from a very, very high level. But they're thinking about business endeavors and the risks associated there, physical security. They're looking at risks within the organization as a whole. All right now, your chief information officer is primarily focused on value delivery. So when we're talking about security risks, that usually actually goes to the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, more so than the Chief Risk Officer or the CIO. Your CISO is going to address confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And they should have a clear line of reporting. They should report directly to the CEO, to the Board of Directors, to a steering committee. But I don't want to have to go to my boss and say, man, We've got too much exposure to risk the way you've configured things. You left us with a mess, buddy. I'm not doing that to my boss. So I want to make sure that if we do have these gaping vulnerabilities or holes in our security, that I can report those without fear of repercussion. A clear line of reporting is what we're looking at there. Now, um, the information security manager talked about this just a little bit yesterday, and the role here is figuring out how. So. If I need to uh, provide services at a certain degree of availability, the manager is going to say, here's how we're going to do it, right? We're going to have backup power supplies. We're going to use a UPS. We're going to have a generator. We're going to do this, that, and the other. So governance, what we're doing, management, how we're going to do it. A role or two roles, rather, that are really important is to understand the difference between the data owner and the data custodian. Now, the data owner, we've already, whoops, sorry about that. We've really, we've talked about this, but I just want to re-emphasize for good measure, the data owner, it could show up on the exam as the business unit, the lines of business, um, operations, you know, however it'll come up, make it clear that that's the part of the business that's using the data, that created the data usually, um, and often they're the same entity as the system owner. So the data owner usually is the system owner, meaning, all right, I own the data and determine the security as well as the system that stores the data. That's not always the case, but generally. But at any rate, these are the entities that are the deciders. So if there's a decision to be made, the data owner is the entity that makes that decision. Who gets access to the data? Ask the data owner. What sort of security control should be in place? Ask the data owner. What's the value of the asset? Ask the data owner, right? All those decisions go to the data owner. But remember, we don't just put this and say, hey, Bob, what do you think this data's worth? We have a classification scheme 
that that data owner can look to and can say, hey, based on the value of the asset, high, medium, or low is the categorization of the data. Then, based on other criteria that's predefined, we say, okay, um, data that is of medium security needs should have these specific security controls applied. Right. That's how it is within the government military. There are um, there are a couple of documents, for instance, when you're looking at categorizing sensitive data for use in the government or military. There's a document called FIPS 199 that is not testable, but it's a document that essentially tells you how to ass assess the value of data based on its confidentiality, integrity and availability needs. And after you go through that process, you come up with the security categorization. Now, that security categorization has a set of controls associated with each cat characterization, categorization, okay? Now, FIPS 200 and NIST 853 are gonna tell you what security controls to implement based on the categorization of data. Again, I don't need you to memorize those, but I just want you to have kind of the flow in your mind. I need a document that tells me how to determine what the value of data is. Then I need another document that tells me, based on the data's value, what controls we're going to put in place. And what's also important is that we protect data throughout its life cycle. So, for instance, if while data is in storage, we encrypt it. When data moves to archival, we encrypt it as well, right? We don't have it really secure in one format or send it across the network unencrypted or archive it unencrypted. So the classification scheme is what gives our owners the understanding of how to categorize data and how it should be protected. That's all I'm saying there is you need documentation, you need formalized policies and procedures in place. Now our data custodian, these are the folks that do the day-to-day. -day. I mentioned this yesterday. Usually this is the IT or the information security team that's responsible for implementing the security that the data owner chose. So whereas the data owner may say this needs to be encrypted and only available to people of this role within the organization, the custodians are the ones that can figure that security and those controls. All right, so those are the big roles. I do think those are testable. Now, across the next couple of slides, next handful of slides, I'm going to go through some risk management frameworks. But Kelly, you promised me we were done with frameworks after yesterday. Don't trust me. I tell lies sometimes. No, I don't. What I want to let you know is frameworks are just part of our life and in information security, and that's a good thing. We go to the frameworks for guidance so that we can follow tried and true um, examples that are out there for us. And we're only looking at just a couple, so I'll make this as painless as possible. The good news, you're not going to see a lot of risk frameworks on the exam. They may refer to them. They may ask you for the gist of them. But again, it's not like you have to go download NIST documents and go through them with a fine tooth comb. All right, so I'll try to make this painless. So when we talk about NIST frameworks, um, so the National Institute of Standards and Technology is a great place to go for various frameworks. They have published a series of documents, special publications in the 800 range that apply specifically to cybersecurity. Now we have a couple in the NIST 800-30ish uh, range that talk to us about risk. Now, one of the first documents is that we'll look at is NIST 800-39. And so basically, what they do is they talk about, I'm going to skip this and come back to it in just a second. They talk about risk management in a tiered fashion, meaning that you've got the organization, the business as a whole, and the needs of the business as a whole drive what our business processes are, which in turn drive what information management systems we use and how we protect them. So just like we've been saying, start at the top, understand the business. To satisfy goals and objectives of the business, we'll need certain processes. 
and to support those processes, we use information systems. So we have to look at risk across those three tiers. What are risks to the business? What are risks to our processes? What are risks to our systems? Now notice, um, what I'll tell you is, well, what I'll stress is, again, start at the top. Business, processes, systems. Now, in addressing risks across these different tiers, they're going to use another framework, NIST 800-30, to look at the process of framing our risks, assessing them, responding, and monitoring. This is the process, or per NIST 139 and NIST 800-30, these are the steps we go through with risk management. Now you'll notice that frame, framing is in the middle and it feeds into all the other processes. Well, that's context. Just like we talked about earlier, you gotta start with context. I've gotta stop and I've gotta think about what is it unique about our organization? If we're ISO 27001 compliant, we have risks that we might lose our certification if we don't properly carry out these steps or processes, if we don't have those in place. Or if we ha are under regulatory compliance, we've got to think about risks of liability or being found out of compliance. So we always start with our context. In this case, it's called frame or framing our risks. Now, it then moves to risk assessment. Risk assessment sometimes gets used a little differently, but the ultimate purpose of risk assessment is always gonna be to help us determine the appropriate risk responses. So I don't just go in and say, encrypt the data with the strongest algorithm known to man. I've got to go in and figure out what my risks are, what the probability and impact is, and I've got to determine what trade-offs I'm willing to make for risk. Do I need to use a 2048-bit algorithm for my grocery list? No. Why? Because the performance is impacted too much to protect the fact that I'm getting rice a -roni. So the assessment piece helps me identify the risks and help me determine the loss potential. The loss potential is the main input into my decision about response. Now, when I respond to a risk, I think about reducing the risk. Well, actually before that, I think about just accepting the risk. Maybe the risk is fine where it is, but if it's not, remember I apply controls that reduce the risk. We'll talk about risk transference, where I can get another organization to share the risk with me, like insurance. But some way, based on the risk assessment, I determine how to respond, and I implement the response strategies. And we continue to monitor. We monitor to make sure our risk controls are working as appropriate, they're meeting their objectives, but we're also monitoring for those black swan events that we talked about. Who knows what's coming down the pipe, you know, next go round. Um, so we monitor. And when we monitor, we may determine emerging risks that we have to assess, figure out how to respond to, respond, and then we continue to monitor. So this is an iterative framework, assess, respond, monitor, assess, respond, monitor, all the while keeping the framing of our organization in the context of our business in mind. So NIST 839 and NIST 800-30, and I, I've gone into more detail on these. Um, I have a slide for each topic, but, you know, you get the gist of what we're saying. Framing the risks, um, the different tiers of the organization. I can go into some of this a little bit more, um, but ultimately, the idea is the organization feeds into the business processes, which dictate the systems that we have in use. So at the organizational level, we're looking about the enterprise as a whole, just like I said. Uh, let's see here. 
boy, I went way down the rabbit hole on this. This is more than you need for SISM, which is why these are my slides that I've done a little copying and pasting from C-Risk, so I've gone way in depth for some of this. So give me a little bit of liberty if I move past, because I'm going to keep us focused on the SISM exam and what we need for that. So once again, on SISM, they're not going to crush you with frameworks. They may ask you, where would I go to determine um, risk mitigation at the organization process and information systems level? That would be as deep as they would go into any of these NIST standards. Honestly, chances are pretty good you're not even going to see them reference NIST. Why? Well, it's an international exam. And how can I expect someone in Canada to be familiar with the standards that are used here in the U.S. for government and military? Because that's primarily what NIST you know, provides standards for. So the reason that I have them here is just a reference, just in case they would show up. But I also want to make sure you know how many resources there are out there to learn about risk, to learn about approaches to risk and concerns for risk so that after this class, whether you decide to get certified with SISM or not, you've got some tools that you can use as you continue to build your experience on risk. And then also we're going to have an upcoming um, C-Risk class uh, in the future as well. I don't have the dates or anything. Like I said, we're still a work in progress. That's going to be a great class where we get into these more at this level. So for NIST 835, the three tiers of risk management. That's what you need to know for CISM. And again, that relationship. The organization informs uh, or impacts the processes which impact the systems. Now, when we do talk about our information systems and protecting those individually, we're going to get more into this tomorrow with our security program chapter, but the software development life cycle or the system development life cycle. And the idea that we have to incorporate risk management throughout the development phase of our software or our systems. So many times we build a system and then security is an afterthought. We build it for function and then we ask ourselves, well, is it secure? But the thing is, you don't just dumb luck into security, right? You don't just go, Psh, wow, we built a secure system. Who knew? You got to plan for security. And I can't plan for security if, unless when I collect requirements for a, so for a software package or for a system, I start by looking at what the requirements are and making sure that there's security requirements in align with the value of the system. So as we go through a design process, and this software or system development life cycle is over here on the left with initiation, acquisition, implementation, operations, and maintenance, and disposal. So, you know, if we look at this, these key areas, risk management needs to be integrated throughout the entire process. Right, not just at initiation and certainly not just in operations, but every step of the software development, system development life cycle, we've got to incorporate security. So when we look at initiation, this is where we're determining what we need. This is where we collect requirements. And we have to make sure that we understand if we're developing a system, we have to understand the value of what that system's protecting. So we have to categorize the system based on the value of the assets. What are my confidentiality, my integrity, my availability objectives documented here? We are first thinking of conducting a risk assessment. We're doing this in a preliminary stage, right? We're not getting into all the little details, but we are looking at risks from a high level determining the categorization of the system, and then making sure that we have a definition of the security controls that go with that categorization. Now, acquisition and development. When we develop this system, right, we're now into writing the software package, we've got to incorporate controls that apply to the specific categorization of the data. So if I determine that we have to, that we have needs to 
uh, provide 256-bit encryption, well, in the development stage, we're going to incorporate something like AES that's going to be able to apply the appropriate security or provide the necessary encryption. So what we determine in initiation will drive what we develop. If instead we're outsourcing and we're acquiring systems from a vendor, we have to make sure that that vendor has controls in place to meet the categorization of the system. So initiation, we figure out what our security needs are. When developing or acquiring a system, we make sure that those security needs are protected during development, not as an afterthought. Um, we hear people say should be baked in, not sprayed on. And unfortunately, we tend to spray on security. If you're from the South like I am, you know what I mean by that. We put butter in everything, but biscuits I'm thinking about. You got to put butter into the biscuit dough. You just make some dry old biscuit and slather on some butter after the fact. That's no good. We got to bake in from the start. I know I need it. I build it in and I have a better product. Okay. All right. Where are my Southerners out there? Hello to you. Excuse me. Hello to y'all. Hey, y'all is really what I should say. All right. So initiation, get our requirements, acquisition, make sure the requirements are met by design, and then we implement. Now we implement in a lab environment. So if I've developed a software package, I'm going to take it to the lab, I'm going to install it, and I'm going to test it. At the end of implementation is where we get certification and accreditation. And with security certification, what we're doing is we're verifying that the controls work as designed, that the product meets the security criteria as defined. So it's a technical test. We're conducting pen tests of the software or the system. And ideally, certification would lead to accreditation. So it's certified the product behaves as expected in relation to security needs. That then goes to senior leadership and accreditation, whoever the accrediting authority is, or the authorizing official. Sometimes you hear accreditation, sometimes you hear authorization. But whoever the authorizing official is, they determine that, okay, this product was certified. Yes, it meets our needs. We're going to implement it. So before a product goes out to operations, it gets certified and then authorized or accredited. If the product goes through pen testing, for instance, security testing, and does not meet the credential or criteria. So it goes through pen testing and there's a failure. Usually what happens then is we create a POAM. And a POAM is a plan of actions and milestones. So I've built this product and I think I've built it well. It goes through testing and it fails. What do we need? Well, I need to plan to fix the problems. And that's a POAM. If it did meet the testing, next step, certified, then accredited or authorized, then it goes out to operations where we install it out in the work environment or as it's intended to be used. And we maintain the systems. We uh, monitor and make sure the uh, system or, or software is behaving as expected. And if not, we may get another POAM. We may have to patch meaning that product may have to go back through certification and accreditation, and it likely will, all the way up to the point where eventually all good things come to an end. At the end of the software system development life cycle is disposal. And I have to make sure that I dispose of systems, software, in a secure manner. Have I sanitized the media? Or have I just taken a... Uh, a drive that contains top secret information and put it in the trash. Probably not a good idea, right? So all of these pieces are part of the software development or system development life cycle. We need to incorporate risk throughout. Many times people just look at the top of this chart and say, okay, here's what I got to do in each of these phases. But we've got to take security and apply it to each one. All right. Now, 
I've really talked about, uh, I just wanted to kind of get caught up. We've talked about each of these, but I'm just going to reiterate. Framing a risk, get the context of what you're applying risk management to. An organization, a system, a network, a, a segment, whatever. And we think about the unique elements of our organization or our structure that are going to impact how we approach risk. Risk assessment, the goal of risk assessment is to help me determine how to mitigate. So assessment feeds directly into response. What controls am I going to put in place? Am I going to accept the risk? Do I need to transfer that risk and share the risk with the third party? And the ongoing monitoring process. I know there's some redundancy in these slides, but I just want to, uh, you know, kind of stress that. I also, one more time, want to indicate this is not an exam of memorizing nitpicky details. So if you're spending three hours, you know, drilling NIST standards in your mind or organizational frameworks or security frameworks and and IEEE standards and types of cable and all that stuff, that's not the approach to this exam. So what I would have you gain from what we've talked about so far is, you know, there's a flow that comes with risk management. And different frameworks may use slightly different names for, for the different phases, but the gist of what we're doing, figuring out our organization and what requirements we have to align with business objectives. Determine what the risks are, what they're worth, we respond to them, and we monitor. We have various documents that are going to provide us with ways to do that, but that flow of risk management is what's important. Now, I said uh, NIST 800 39 goes hand in hand with NIST 800 B. So ultimately, you know, we go back to NIST 800-30, click, 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 click. Okay. We talked about frame and then assess, right? Then respond and monitor. Well, the assessment piece, that's where we get our information that's going to help us make good decisions. So how we assess risks is spelled out for us in NIST 800-30. What is a risk assessment and how do we approach it? Well, remember, this is a framework, right? We get frameworks from NIST, these, these documents. So it's not going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Here's how you assess all the risks for every system. However, we start with figuring out, you know, we've already put the context to it. What is the purpose of an assessment? Just like I said, it's going to help determine how we respond to risk and again respond to risk in the appropriate manner how much risk can we tolerate what are our thresholds what's the value of what we're protecting what's probability and likelihood of a particular event all that comes to play here okay so what we're ultimately trying to get ideally would be a dollar value for our potential loss. You can't get a dollar value out of everything, right? I can't tell you there's a $376 risk associated with anything, whatever the risk may be. Um, I can estimate, remember, this is still unknown, so everything we're doing is estimation and, and making educated guesses. But again, after the event happens, it's not even a risk. So there's always going to be room for error. And we have to consider that, right? Especially when we're managing projects or endeavors. I give my best estimation, but I'm also going to build in a little bit of cushioning in case I'm a little off one way to it or the other. Um, also, things like customer reputation or confidence or or those sorts of things again are really hard to put a dollar value on 
So we may not, we'd love to get a dollar value for the risk. I'd love to know this is a $376 risk. So I'll spend up to $375 to keep it from happening. It's just not that clear cut, of course. All right. So NIST 830 is going to define a risk assessment. Actually, the framework itself is going to start off by providing us, or how do I want to say that? It wants to give us, um, what do I want to say there? Well, the best way to say it is we're looking for a methodology, an approach. I'm looking for guidance to conduct a risk assessment. Now, with that, I have to have a process. Well, NIST 800-30 tells me the process, not the details, but the generic flow of how I assess risks. All right, then we look at a risk model. And a risk model is going to show us what we're trying to do in a more tangible form. It's going to help us uh, provide guidance. It's going to help us define our process. It's going to help us determine the, the lexicon, the terminology that we use. Then we have to determine are we going to, um, how we're going to conduct our assessments, whether we're going to use qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative assessments are subjective. They're sort of gut level, um, quantitative or dollar values. We'll see all this in a, in a little bit. And then What's our approach to conduct analysis? Most of the time I talk about in this class, starting with your assets. Here are the things that I value, business processes, data, whatever. And I could also start from a threat-based approach. I could just say, okay, in information security, what threats are out there? Or I could start from the perspective of vulnerabilities and say, here are all the weaknesses that exist within our environment. And then think about what threats could exploit and what the impact would be. So honestly, when you're conducting a risk assessment, the methodology is what you define very early on. So that anybody that comes in and follows your assessment, I'm trying to say, well, how did you come up with this? I can go back and look at your methodology, follow the same process using the same model, using the same approaches, and I should come up with very similar information. Or I may turn this over to senior leadership and they may say, you got a, a fault in your methodology. You're not using the right process or we're going to use a different model based on our industry. So I just want you to know that when you're conducting assessment, one of the first things that you do, you know, you frame it, you have your documentation, you define your scope. You also have to define your methodology. OK, so. As part of my defined methodology, the processes. What am I doing? Okay. What information, what documents am I going to use? Who's going to be conducting the processes? What steps are they going to take to evaluate? How do they assess risks? What sort of estimation techniques do they use? What's their data source? What sort of confidence do they have in certain types of data? So there's no black and white answer. It's just that you have to define your processes as part of your methodology. And again, someone that's following in your shoes will be able to follow the same methodology. Before we just jump in and say, uh, that's probably um, malware uh, threats are going to have a high likelihood and impact. You know, before we start going in and spouting off these ideas, process, process process, an orderly and methodical process. We document how any one of our assessors should be able to come in, look up the processes, and conduct this risk assessment. Okay, so the first part we define in our methodology is our process. Then we define a model. Now, this risk model is defined in NIST 800-30, and it says, okay, when you're looking specifically at risks for the organization or for a system, in this model, starting with the threat source, an, an internal uh, attacker. 
So an internal attacker might initiate a threat event like an improper access of data that might exploit a vulnerability like acts, uh, lack of authentication or lack of access control. Okay. So, um, you know, there may be predisposing conditions like being on a dated system that doesn't have capability of running more robust security. That might be a predisposing condition. Um, the idea is we need security controls in place and we've got to figure out how effective they are to prevent this exploit. But that vulnerability and threat event are going to lead to some sort of exploit. What's the severity? And how likely is it to happen? Probability and impact. And then overall, what's the total amount of risk? So that's the methodology that's spelled out in NIST 800-30. The assessment approach, this was a threat-oriented assessment approach. Like I said, we can start with asset or vulnerability. And then how are we going to conduct the assessment? What information do you want at the end of an assessment? Do you want a list of low risks, medium risks, high risks? Or do you want a, a dollar value for each risk based on research and analysis? Now, obviously, a qualitative assessment is going to be much quicker than a quantitative assessment. A quantitative assessment takes a high degree of skill, experience, a lot of analysis, um, a lot of examination of data. Whereas a qualitative analysis, I can give you a qualitative analysis pretty quickly. You know, if we don't have anti-malware on a system, how likely is it to uh, get compromised with malware? It's really likely. It's highly likely. Now, that doesn't tell you how much money to spend on anti-malware, but it does tell you that needs to be one of the first things that you think about. It's putting malware on a system. It's one of the greatest risks, right? putting anti-malware on a system, because malware is a tremendous risk. High probability and high impact if I don't mitigate. So even though qualitative analysis doesn't necessarily give us as much information as we need, It'll help me prioritize my risks and figure out where to spend my money, you know, first, basically. So qualitative is gut level. Quantitative is usually dollar. Not everything comes down to a dollar, but most everything comes down to the dollars, right? The bottom line is that quantitative analysis uses empirical data. It's fact-based. It's not subjective or opinion-based. And then um, semi-quantitative basically means that you're still giving subjective information, but you're associating numbers with it. So I might say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it to rain this weekend? Or on a scale of 1 to 5, how likely is it the Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl? So that would be semi-quantitative. At first, it looks like quantitative because you're seeing numbers, but you realize that those numbers have just been subjectively assigned. All right. That, I'll just mention, uh, this is a temperature map or a heat map that is used, uh, it's called the probability and impact matrix. It's a good tool to help me visualize different types of risks. So if I say a risk has a, you know, a scale of one to five, it has a four for um, probability and a three for impact. Well, I can just visually say up, oh, that's in this orange category. And then my organization may say, Okay, risks in the red must be immediately mitigated. Risks in orange must be uh, mitigated within the next day, yellow within the next week, green risks can be accepted. So I can use this to visualize, but also will often have mitigation strategies in alignment with each of the colors 
just so that we can kind of make sure that we're mitigating as appropriate based on probability and impact. All right, now that is a fantastic place to take another break. Yay, we do love a break, don't we? Um, let's do this. It is, I tell you what, let's be back in 10 minutes. It's almost, let's be back at one. Okay, I give you a few extra minutes for a uh, break. Uh, just a couple though. Let's take our uh, normal break. Let's be back at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And we will pick up with more fun and games. All right, everybody have a good break. Be back at one.
All right, we are back and we just been looking at some of the frameworks in relation to risk and we looked at NIST 800-39 that talked about the tiers of the organization and considering risk at each tier. Um, organizational risks lead us to implement business processes that lead us to select the appropriate uh, information systems and we implement controls at each of the levels. I have organizational controls, I have process-based controls, I have system-based controls. And it also defined the process or the, the risk management life cycle, if you will, that said we're gonna frame our risks, assess them to get a value, choose the response based on the value of the risk, and then continue to monitor. And then we looked at NIST 800-30 that showed us or focused in on the risk assessment piece. We talked about assessments being qualitative or quantitative. Now, the last of the NIST frameworks I'm gonna talk about here is the risk management framework or RMF. Now, we'll look at RMF, um, which is uh, NIST Special Publication 800-37. We have Revision 1 and we have Revision 2. Of course, the current's Revision 2. I just want to show you the difference because it, it kind of makes me laugh. All right, so what are the steps of the risk management framework? Well, you start by identifying your assets and determining their value. You remember that? Well, in NIST 800-37, we categorize as our first step. What does that mean? Figure out your assets and what are they worth. So based on the value of the asset for the system, we determine its security categorization. That's what NIST, uh, I'm sorry, that's what FIPS 199 does. We talked about that just as a reference earlier. You do not need to memorize these NIST standards or special publications. The flow and the purpose, the intent of what we're doing. So we categorize the system. Then we select controls based on the system category. And the documents that help me there are FIPS 200 and NIST 853. Again, I'm only pointing out a handful of documents because if you want some additional information or some additional insight, particularly if you're in the government, military, you know, these NIST documents, provide the framework for our, our organizations and our environments. So I've given them to you just in case you want to do some extra reading, right? Um, but don't feel like you need it for the exam. Now the flow of RMF and more specifically its purpose, which is to incorporate, um, to build a secure system. How do you take that? Remember we looked at the system development life cycle. Well, with the system development life cycle, how do you integrate or infuse that SDLC with risk management? That's what the RMF or the risk management framework's for. So you categorize, you select your controls based on the category, you implement the controls, and then you assess the controls. Remember, that's where your penetration testing happens for software and for hardware systems. At the end of assessment, you should have uh, a system that's passed certification, the technical assessment. If it doesn't, remember that's where our POAM comes in and we go right back up to the beginning of categorizing security controls, implementing and so on. But if it does get certified, the next step is to authorize the system and then it goes out to production where we monitor the system. So NIST's RMF just shows us the process and how we integrate security throughout the life cycle of the system. And this little illustration kind of shows you, okay, where do these steps of the risk management framework fit in in relation to the software development or system development lifecycle? I think this is a great chart. Um, I think it really kind of helps us see, all right, sure, in initiation, initi uh, let me try that again. In initiation, it's where we categorize, then for design, to design, this is where we determine what controls need to go in, and then we implement the controls in the implementation piece. We test or assess, and then we authorize the system before it goes into operations and maintenance, which is where we monitor. So there's a direct correlation between what we looked at with the software development lifecycle and the risk management framework. This is all important. 
so that we can design and build a secure system as opposed to building a system that's not secure and securing it after a patch. You will always get a better product if you bake in security instead of spray it on at the end. Okay, if you're ever confused about that, think about biscuits. We learned earlier. All right, now the I mentioned that we first looked at NIST 800-37 revision one, but revision two came out in December 2018. Does anybody notice what the difference is? The only difference is that preparation is put here in the middle. Now, I agree, preparation is incredibly important, should happen at the beginning of each of these stages. It just cracks me up because I think about how much money had to have been spent to revise NIST 837 Revision 1, and how much money and time and how many sign-offs had to happen just to say, oh, don't forget to prepare. Screaks me up. So the new risk management framework, NIST 837 Revision 2, puts repair, prepare here in the middle. All right. So we've determined the context of our organization. We've determined what our business objectives and goals are. Um, we have looked at assessing risk, which ultimately uses either a qualitative or quantitative means to determine a risk value, low, medium, and high, or we can do it quantitatively. We may look back at incident response reports or lessons learned, or we may monitor um, other reports of loss within our industry, whatever. So we've taken the steps to get a value for the risk, qualitative or quantitative or both. So we've got a prioritization of the risks and in what order we address them. And if we did a quantitative analysis, we get a dollar value for the loss. So what's left to do or what's next to do is to respond to the risks, right? I know what I have on the table. I know what I stand to lose. So what I have to do is I have to look at that amount and determine is it acceptable or not? And if it's not, I have to figure out a response. Now, just like always, our response has to be in alignment with business objectives. So if our response is to, or if our um, business objective is to increase security, maybe we've just been uh, the target of a breach, or maybe we have uh, updates to legislation or regulations that require more stringent security, well, then my risk response are going to be, my risk responses are going to be more robust. If instead I want to increase ease of use, sell more product, have more uh, transactions on my websites, fewer, you know, cancellations midway through, whatever, then in that case, I may be willing to tolerate more risk. So I hate to keep going back and kind of harping on this, but this is just all over the exam. Security to meet the needs of the business, not security for the sake of security. How much security is enough? Look at the assets. Look at threats and vulnerabilities. There's your risk. Get a value for the risk, and that drives how much security is enough versus what the trade-offs are. OK, so I can think of multiple questions where they, you know, wanted to know what's the first step in deciding how much security to implement. I mean, this is very broad and objective. It's not like a security question, but the point I saw in multiple questions was start with your assets. What are they worth? And then build from there. All right. Now, for risk response, we take that information that we learned through risk assessment. And at the end of risk res assessment, really we should have produced uh, something called a risk assessment report that documents the risks as well as recommended action. Because ideally at the end of risk assessment, we have some recommendations. 
That assessment will lead me to determine what mitigation strategies to put in place. So in this action plan, this is where I am making my recommendations, working with the risk owner to determine how we're going to respond to risk. So of course, I have to look at things like what's my organizational appetite, what's my risk tolerance, where are we currently? Um, you know, in a lot of ways, our risk action plan is the result of gap analysis. What is our risk profile now? What do we want our risk profile to be? How do we close the gap between where we are and what we want to be or where we want to be? So we assess our current environment. What is our level of risk? What regulations exist and where we stand on being in compliance? Again, plans of the business. Another business driver is the general public. You know, the public often, customers or, you know, often have an input on how we respond to risks. What are our competitors doing? Are they making progress? Are they gaining market share? Or are they failing because of poorly managed risks? We can learn a lot from other companies, sometimes by what they do right, and sometimes by what they do wrong. And then we get an action plan. So now this is just a very broad sort of idea about determining our risk responses. Or, or, or a, it's not a broad idea. It's, it's, it's a, a framework, if you will, or um, a methodology, really more of a methodology. But you'll notice the source down at the bottom is ISACA, specifically with COVID-5. So again, ISACA is the organization that puts out the SISM exam. COVID-5 is one of their frameworks. So not memorizing every little square here, but getting the flow. So what's the flow? The flow is figure out what your risks are. One of the ways we determine what our risks are is we can use risk scenarios. And a risk scenario is where I kind of play that what if game. Okay, well, I've got the asset I'm looking at now is my process. Uh, I've, I've got intellectual property, for instance. So what are some scenarios that might illustrate risk to intellectual property? Well, one scenario might be that my competitor uh, uses a malicious internal employee to gain access to intellectual property. So that's a risk scenario. Let's play it out and say, okay, this could happen. Well, then I'm going to analyze and assess the risk and ultimately determine what's the probability and impact. How likely is it to happen? And if it does, what's the severity? That's my assessment piece. All right, so that's my potential for loss. Is that within, you know, my levels of acceptance? If it's not, you know, so one, response might be to accept it. So if it's within my levels of acceptance, I'm going to accept the risk. And when I accept a risk, I do nothing. Meaning, I don't implement controls. I say where that risk is, is fine with me. Because controls cost money, they take time, they slow down the process, they may not be compatible in your environment. Right. There are all sorts of drawbacks to implementing controls. So if I can accept that risk, if it's in my level for acceptance, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Nothing. Well, that doesn't mean that I just go la, 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 la. You know, I still have business continuity. I still monitor for risk events. You know, I, I don't just go bury my head in the sand but I use a good business decision based on analyzing probability and impact and cost of countermeasures, okay? So I don't want to just indicate that risk accept acceptance is carefree, just saying, ah, I don't need to worry about that. I've done my due diligence, all right? Or I can mitigate the risk. Now with risk mitigation over here uh, in the center rectangle on the left side, risk mitigation means I'm gonna lessen the probability and or impact of a risk. That's what mitigation is all about, lessening probability and or impact. 
I can't lessen the probability of rain, but I can take an umbrella so the impact is less. I can't lessen the impact of malware, but I can use anti-malware software to lessen the probability of getting infected, right? So I, when I choose to mitigate, it's because the amount of risk is too high and I have to bring it down to acceptable levels. Mitigation lessens probability or impact. Now, sharing or transferring the risk means that I'm going to share that loss potential with another organization, like insurance. I'm worried that I'm going to get into an accident and cause damage uh, that's greater than what I can afford. So I get insurance. And if I'm in an accident, the insurance company will pay the damages, or at least a portion of the damages. Just like um, if I use a cloud service provider and I'm concerned about compromise to my sensitive data. I get a service level agreement from that cloud service provider that guarantees how they're going to secure and protect my data, as well as what compensation is returned to me in the event that there is a breach. So they're sharing that loss with me. Or I could just avoid the risk altogether. Now, the problem with avoiding the risk is that I'm not doing something that I planned on doing, right? Like um, I'm considering opening an office in an area that has a lot of uh, civil and political unrest. I do my research because of the possibility that human life would be impacted. I say I'm just not going to open that branch office. That's risk avoidance. Um, if there's a threat of loss of life or um, any other high impact, we, we may choose to avoid the risk. Usually we mitigate or transfer if we can't accept the risk. Okay. And then we implement the responses and we monitor. So you can kind of see the flow here. The responses get prioritized. We get our action plan written. And then we implement the steps that we've chosen. Now, the four main risk response options I've just gone through, but I just want to go through and just hit a little point here or there. Um, risk acceptance, I want to stress, it is a conscious decision made to acknowledge the risk exists but to allow the function to continue without mitigation. Okay, so big piece here. It's a conscious decision. It is not one of those, let me put my fingers in my ear, la, 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 it'll never happen to me. It's not telling the IT person to get out of my office because what they're telling me is not what I want to hear. I use due diligence to determine probability and impact and potential for loss. I examine the cost of the countermeasures and their effectiveness, and I look at that up against the potential for loss. Often, when risk, risk acceptance is my choice, the cost of mitigation is greater than the potential for loss. I'm not going to spend 50 bucks to protect a $20 bill, right? So I accept the risks. So it has to fall within the risk acceptance criteria that senior management has set forth. The risk tolerance, what sort of risks will they accept? What sort of risks do they mitigate? What sort of risks do they transfer? And it exists again within the organizational risk appetite. So I don't just haphazardly choose to accept a risk because it's too much hassle to deal with. It has to be a good business decision. And risk ignorance, which is um, which might look on the outside to be the same as risk acceptance, because with risk acceptance, we don't do anything. We don't implement mitigation. And certainly with risk ignorance, we don't implement mitigation. But the difference is risk acceptance shows due diligence. I can show a good business decision. Okay. Which would I be more likely to be found liable if I'm, you know, making the choice choices based on risk ignorance? I will also just mention that sometimes you may have no choice but to accept a risk. 
right? Just got notification that um, a tornado has been sighted in the area. Well, at this point in time, I not much I can do about it. So I accept that risk. Now, ideally, we've got business continuity in place or we had addressed that risk earlier and have a strategy, you know, an evacuation plan, some emergency response um, in a project. I just found out that software is delayed by three weeks that we need to conduct this project. It's going to mean that our project finishes three weeks late. Sometimes you just have to accept the risk. Now, a lot of times when it impacts your project estimates, um, it might indicate that you didn't appropriately calculate risks earlier on. Doesn't have to. As a matter of fact, this slide down at the bottom, risk acceptance is often based on poorly calculated risk levels. That, that's not really true. I know what I meant when I wrote this slide, but the reality of it is it can be based on poorly cal calculated risk levels. Maybe in the example up above it was, but sometimes you just have no choice but to accept a risk. But usually when we choose to accept a risk, it's because the countermeasure in relation to, you know, doesn't, the cost of the countermeasure is greater than the potential for loss or the value of the asset. All right, now mitigation lesson probability and or impact. So what we're doing is we're bringing the amount of risk down. Risk management requires that we bring risk down to a level of acceptance. I think that concept will come up a lot. What's the goal of risk management? Reduce residual risk to a degree that's acceptable. So mitigation goes on. And then if what's left over is still unacceptable, we mitigate some more, mitigate some more. Maybe we transfer risks that are remaining, but we want the residual risk to be tolerable or acceptable, within acceptable limits. One of the main ways that we mitigate risks is through our security program. Like I said, we're going to talk about that tomorrow, but basically, how do I mitigate risk? I implement policies, procedures, standards, guidelines. I implement Proactive controls, reactive controls, detective controls. I have well-defined roles and responsibilities within my organization so that my team knows what they're doing and when and what their responsibilities are. I mitigate risks through my security program. That's where the mitigation comes in. And that's what we're talking about tomorrow. And um, that's also the more technical portion of class not a technical exam, but we do start talking about some technology in our security program because a big part of how we mitigate risk is through technology. So that's one of the things we'll look at tomorrow. Okay, risk avoidance. Now again, we choose to do something different. I'm worried about the risks associated with an employee who's been caught embezzling, so I fire the employee. That's risk avoidance. Okay. I am concerned about the risks associated with hosting my own website, so I don't host my own website. Um, you know, we, we do something different. That may tend to be sort of a drastic response, but if the impact of a risk is high enough, risk avoidance is warranted. And then again, risk sh uh, sharing or transference, insurance, service level agreements, outsourcing, those are ways we transfer risks. All right, now pausing like I always do, just to check in, see if anybody wants to jump in and ask a question, if anybody's got any thoughts, any ideas that you wanna share. All right. Just a reminder, at any point in time, jump in with your questions. Now I'm gonna go ahead and move on and just talk about some of the tools that we use to manage risks. Earlier, I had mentioned a risk scenario. And we said a risk scenario is really kind of playing the what if game. What if, well, what if what? All right, well, I have an asset. Who might cause harm to that access? 
who are my threat actors? Well, often with an organization, we really think about, is it, you know, and we protect differently based on the threat actor. So first of all, let's think about um, an external vandal to a website. So my assets, my website, and its data, what threat actor am I examining? Well, we'll start by looking at external actors. And an external van, uh, vandal would be malicious. But there are also other types of security violations that are accidental or just, you know, hurricanes, floods, whatever, sort of natural things. So the idea is who's the threat? What type of threat actor? What's the threat type? What event would it cause? So uh, might cause corruption of data, might cause problems with availability. You know, that would be the event. And then when we talk about timing, a lot of times it's really important when we deal with risks because if it takes us a long time to detect, we might have to be more vigilant with our monitoring. If it takes us longer to respond to certain types of, of risks, we may try to um, uh, have to monitor for very minimal changes instead of waiting till there's a major change. You know, I'm, I'm just sometimes how we respond to a risk is driven by how quickly that risk materializes, how easy it is to detect, how often from the risk event happening do we see the damage. Those are all concerns with timing. So when we go through and develop risk scenarios, this is a way, certainly a tool that we might use with our risk team to just brainstorm and sort of identify the risks that are of highest uh, concern. Now, the risk register is another really important document. You may have this, um, a, um, an automated risk register or an electronic risk register rather, but we need a centralized location to store our risk information. It should be a central repository that can be populated by risk owners. Doesn't necessarily mean I share the risk register with all my owners. I may it usually, it's, you know, on a need to know basis because it's going to address vulnerabilities that we have and existing threats and responses. We don't make that public information. Uh, what I have here is just a very, very high level risk register. And so at the least, we're going to identify a risk. We're going to hear in the middle impact likelihood and ranking. That's qualitative or really semi-quantitative. We'll call it qualitative. Um, and then I might also have a field for, uh, as a matter of fact, hang on just one second. Um, so I might have a field for the quantitative analysis. So when we do a quantitative analysis of a risk and we come up with a dollar value for the loss potential, that's called the EMV, the expected monetary value of a risk. So I might include that on my register. Um, you notice I have a trigger. That triggers what we watch for to get an indication that the risk is going to materialize. All right, and then I have a proactive strategy and a reactive strategy. How to prevent this risk event from happening, but if it does happen, my contingency is what I do about it. And then notice I also assign an owner to the risk. A risk owner is somebody that has skin in the game. They're the folks that are accountable for the protection of the asset. We want them to be high enough within the organization to be able to authorize and approve changes as far as risk mitigation. Often, if we're looking at uh, threats to data or risks associated with data, the data owners are the risk owners as well. But they're the ones that are ultimately accountable for deciding how we protect the asset, deciding the security category of the data, um, deciding who should have access to the data. And then we also address, address what risk is left over and whether or not we want to further mitigate that particular risk. So this is just, you know, a risk register gives us a central repository. It's a place that we go to track risks. 
we have a risk meeting on a periodic basis and we come in and we update the risk register. Individual owners are usually able to update, you know, and fill up fill out a status category in relation to their risk. Um, you know, let me just show you just a second here. just want to show this one that has just a little bit more I just wanted to show this this has a little bit more than the one I had on screen and actually if you pay attention if you look at each of these fields each field kind of addresses each of the stages of the risk management life cycle so for instance we start out by identifying risks what are those risks and then i can further describe them and i can categorize them you know as part of the description which basically just means that i say okay you know we have a technical risk here uh, denial of service attack, and I may give it a risk category of technical. Then we look at probability and impact qualitatively. High impact, low probability, whatever. Then a dollar value for the risk, the risk owner. All right, how do we respond to the risk? And then status updates. Not perfect. There would be other fields I would add to this. But again, just kind of giving you an idea of what a risk register might look like. Just so, you know, this is one It doesn't, I would add a lot more fields to this, honestly. On the exam, what's important is to understand why we use a risk register. So what I have across the slides is just these very minimal categories and then sort of an explanation. Why do we have a category? What's the risk description? risk ID. Well, I've, I've really gone through each of these. So what I would expect is you would be able to look at the risk register that I have here on the screen and you tell me what each of these mean, what their significance is. Now, I want to mention this risk trigger. And I've said it's an indication the risk event is about to materialize. It's generally the point where we go from prevention to our contingency plan. So our prevention, we're going to do everything we can to stop it. Oops, there's some indication it's happening anyway. We move to contingency. So our prevention plan is we have a firewall, an intrusion, uh, that's intrusion detection system. It's okay. All right. But my trigger is if network utilization exceeds 80%, that's an indication we may be under denial of service. So if we get that trigger, at that point in time, we're going to do a failover to another location. So a trigger indicates the risk events about to materialize. A trigger can also be known as a KRI, a key risk indicator. And again, it tells me, hey, this risk is about to materialize. It is, um, think of it as an early warning early warning system. All right, so we've talked about those elements. Um, and what do we base our decisions for response on? Cost-benefit analysis. And remember, when I get an expected monetary value for a risk, 
you know, there might be a specific amount of loss, right? But we, we, we have to look at things from, do the benefits of the control outweigh the costs of the control? And that doesn't always come down to money, right? So if I turn on encryption, I encrypt some files, it doesn't cost me any money. I don't have to pay every time I use AES encryption. But what do I have to pay, so to speak? Well, encryption slows things down. Strong encryption, um, the most current types of encryption may not be supported by other devices. Users may not want to have to encrypt their files. Um, there may be, you know, there could be any slew of issues. Anytime I add security, it costs me something, right? Sometimes it's performance, like we said, could be backwards compatibility or ease of use or whatever. When I choose my response strategies, I have to think about more than just the dollar amount that that control costs me. I have to consider those other pieces of criteria, right? So my choices come down not just to dollar to dollar, but a true assessment of the cost of the control and what its benefits are. So that goes a little deeper than just having a calculator out saying, you know, 30% times $10,000. Lots of benefits come from security, but there are lots of costs. Always consider those. And let me tell you, user acceptance. I'm not saying that user acceptance is the top criteria for my decision making, but I want it to be as seamless as possible to the users. It should be transparent. They're just going along doing their business. I don't want people having to talk about key exchange or, you know, any sort of crossover error rate for my biometric control. I don't want them talking about that. I want them to do their job and security just happens magically as if elves and fairies were involved, right? I don't want my users to constantly be thinking about the controls I've put in place. Because if so, that means they're not seamless. And that could indicate they're causing more drawbacks than benefits. So cost-benefit analysis needs to be comprehensive. And we need specifically to think about some of the non-tangible cost of security. Now, if we are just talking dollars and cents, and often it's dollars and cents that managers speak, senior executives want to know the profit, right? What's my, or my return on investment? So what I get versus what I spent. And that's one thing, one tool that we can use to demonstrate value delivery. I had a great question yesterday at the end of class about that basically said, look, senior leadership often doesn't want to talk about security, especially cybersecurity. We've got a lot of acronyms, a lot of technical jargon. If you've ever been caught in a discussion with an IT security professional, I had this happen the other day and I was just trying to get a word in edgewise and the person was just going on and on. And I was like, dude, and I'm a security professional, but I don't always want to drown in technical jargon and, and tech speak. Senior leadership does not. So the question, what do you do when they don't want to hear you? You know what you do is you talk value. You talk return on investment. And that goes a lot smoother when you have a proven track record of delivering value, which means we have to think about reframing how we manage our projects, how we set goals and objectives for the projects. Rather than just talking, I want to deliver this project so it can be implemented, let's talk, or this product so the product can be implemented, let's talk about the value my product's going to deliver to the organization. Let's talk about how we're going to reduce man hours lost, how we're going to measure that, and how we're going to prove what we did did deliver value. That's a whole other class. That's with project management. That's with C-Risk. But the bottom line is we got to talk in terms of value. Return on investment, cost-benefit analysis are really important ideas of how we communicate. 
And speaking of communications, we have to make sure that we have a predetermined format. We know how we're going to communicate the information, what fields will be on our risk assessment reports, what formats they're going to be, uh, what information they're going to contain. But ultimately, we continue to monitor our security controls and the performance of our resources and the protection of our assets. Why? Well, because the threat landscape changes. Also, over time, controls become dated or controls become less effective. New threats are constantly emerging. New technology comes out. So this next piece about monitoring and reporting in relation to risks, this is where we make sure what we're doing is working. And when we monitor our controls, the question is, are the controls meeting their objectives? Are we meeting our control objectives? Right? So here, and actually not here, but before we ever implemented a control, we determined our control and determined what the objectives for that control were. So I don't just implement a control and say, I hope it works. Hang on, I just wanted to check something. I got ahead of myself. I can't help it. Um, so before I implement a control, I determine what is this control supposed to do? And I don't know if any of you have heard of SMART objectives specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. I'm going to just write this and have it posted in chat. And I know many of you have probably heard of SMART objectives, but if you haven't, when I set, when I implement a control, I have objectives for that control. Controls should all have objectives. And when I monitor, I'm trying to make sure the objectives are being met. So when I determine what the objectives for my controls are, I need those objectives to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So one of the objectives for a firewall, I want to reduce the number of man hours lost. So that's specific. Something that would be non-specific might be something like, I want to improve security. Well, what does that even mean? Confidentiality, integrity, availability, all three, right? I got to be specific. So the objective for this firewall is I want to reduce the number of man hours lost by 20%, so it's measurable. I didn't say by 100% or, you know, eliminate man hours lost because that's not attainable. And it's relevant to the business. So my objective isn't to reduce the number of thin floods from that firewall, that doesn't mean anything to senior leadership. So I frame it in terms that senior leadership can understand and care about. I'm going to reduce man hours loss because every man hour has a dollar value associated with it. So I'm going to reduce the number of man hours loss by 20% within the end of the first, by the end of the first quarter. Finally, it's bound by time. And when we take on these endeavors and these projects that we wind up managing, our objectives for our projects should, or for our products, should be smart. And if I do these objectives correctly, tie them into business value, that as I'm monitoring controls and they're meeting our objectives, I have specific metrics that I can go to senior leadership and say, look, here's the value that we've delivered. And when I have a proven track record, of delivering value, it's much more likely that I'm going to be able to get the ear of leadership as opposed to 
you know, just saying, hey, we've got another, you know, we need another $100,000 to upgrade equipment, right? I want to have that proven track record in my back pocket so I can say, look, I've been delivering value for you. You know, you can account, you can, you know, assume we're going to have that same benefit for the cost you spend. All right. So monitoring controls. With, with monitoring controls, again, are my controls meeting their objectives? Well, how did I get their objectives? I looked at what the needs were and I looked at the reasons we determined that we needed to control, right? And that's kind of the basis for what the objectives of the control are. So I need to make sure I'm talking to the right people and truly understand the nature of the risk. We've already talked about context and, and framing our risks. We have an assessment so we know the need for the control and the, the parameters that we want to operate within. And we want to make sure that the controls continue to meet their objectives supporting the business. Same stuff we've been talking about. Okay. Now, um, I need to make sure that these assessments are conducted in a timely manner, driven by the risk. Is, you know, am I monitoring uh, firewall performance, my firewall logs every hour, every day, every month, every year? Well, if you're monitoring your firewall every month, that's probably not enough. So with my assessments of my controls, I have to determine, again, before they're ever implemented, what I'm monitoring, how I'm monitoring, what frequency I'm monitoring, who I report to in relation to the results of monitoring. So just like anything else, you have to have a plan. You have to have processes in place. And ultimately, the assessment, is it currently and continually meeting its objectives and mitigating risks to an acceptable level. But now, again, just because it was mitigating risks to an acceptable level last year doesn't mean it will be this year. So we also need to document how often we expect to reassess the controls. Usually it's once a year or in the event of a major change, we go back and look at a category of controls and say, all right, these are still sufficient or they need to be upgraded. Now, this is just KRIs, key risk indicators. Early warning. That's what I want you to associate with KRIs. It's an indication the risk event is going to materialize. Often, it's the point in time where you go from trying to prevent the risk to where you realize, hey, it's going to happen anyway. So how do I reduce the impact? Can't lessen the probability it's here. How do I reduce the impact? How quickly can I detect and correct and recover from this loss? Okay. These are just some examples of KRIs. Um, some of these we'll talk about tomorrow with part of our security program and then also on Friday with risk response. But ultimately, what do I do when I get an, indi you know, an indication a risk event is materializing? Well, that KRI is going to tell me, get moving with it. So, you know, if my risk that we're addressing is, um, oh, maybe a rogue infrastructure on my network, I'm going to scan the network for unauthorized devices. And if I find an unauthorized device, that tells me I need to respond. I need to track that IP address. I need to terminate the connection. I need to do investigations. And that's exactly the purpose of a KRI. Or if I determine that my service provider is not meeting the agreement of our service level agreement, our SLA, they're not meeting the metrics, then I need to respond. My service provider guaranteed me 99.9997% uh, uptime. I'm not getting it while well, I monitor. I'm not getting it. At what point in time do I need to renegotiate the contract, pursue reimbursement, whatever? It's the KRIs. Are we getting the value for what we've paid, basically, or what we've implemented? So, you know, just considerations with your key risk indicators. With sensitivity, you know, this has to do with, um, 
what is your threshold for tolerance with operations? Okay, so let's say I'm concerned about network performance and network performance or network utilization is normally at you know, our baseline average is 44% utilized. So do I want to be notified if it's 44.5% utilized? Probably not, right? So how sensitive is it? When do I get my alerts? Is it with just one tiny variance or is it, you know, do I want to be notified when it hits 60% utilization? How sensitive? You can also think about this like intrusion detection systems. Intrusion detection systems often give us an indication that a risk event has materialized. Now, the problem is sometimes an intrusion detection system can send an alarm that there's malicious activity, but there really isn't. Because usually what it's looking for is sort of the baseline performance of your network. And if something happens that's out of the baseline, that intrusion detection system might sound the alarm and say, hey, we're under attack. But if we're not, that takes administrative overhead. It takes time. Um, it can just be a hassle, right, if you're getting alarms all the time. So you may configure something to be less sensitive. Originally, though, we generally tend to want our devices like intrusion detection systems to be really sensitive and we can back off over time, but we don't want it to miss attacks. You know, so the idea is we've got to think about when we're configuring these uh, control mechanisms, these monitoring tools, how sensitive we want them to be. Okay. Um, with timing, again, we want these KRIs to give us enough warning so that we can respond. So if I say when network utilizations at 99% alert me, well, too bad then, right? So we want to make sure that we set our KRI so that we have time to respond. We have to determine how often we want to sample. The more you sample something, the more performance hit you get. So there are some things we continuously monitor. Whereas other things, like I don't run a malware scan on my system every second of every day. I could never get any sort of performance if that were the case. So once a day, twice a day, whatever. And then, again, I want to be able to um, be able to take corrective action. So I want to make sure that the KRIs that indicate risks allow me or are selected based on things I can control. I can't control the number of attacks targeted at my firewall. I can control the number of attacks that get through my firewall, if that makes sense. So yeah, these are some ideas with our KRIs. Also important to be able to sample and pull information throughout my network. How do I monitor? Well, we have performance tools, right? You know, we have monitoring tools that are out there, a variety of brands, a variety of vendors, individual servers, individual uh, security systems have logs where they track information. We can also look at our incident response reports. If we're looking to gather information about probability and impact, we look to the past. What has happened? We also look to the current. What are we hearing about in the media today? What is being experienced by our competitors? What's going on in our own environment now? What are our users seeing? What do we see? Right. So we have to determine how we're going to monitor. And we want to make sure that we're considering all the different sources of information and that we're taking advantage and leveraging those information sources. Now, the problem on a network can be, though, that there's so much information, it can be hard to pull it all together. And that's where our SIMP systems come into play. And these are the systems that pull information across the network. They can pull information from firewalls, intrusion detection systems, individual server logs, and network devices. Um, their main job is to aggregate. So I don't want to have to go to each switch and dump the logs in the firewall and look at the logs and the intrusion detection system. So I can configure my SIM system to pull that information. 
I can use the tools, you know, Splunk, for instance, if you've ever worked with Splunk, they're, you know, a well-known, uh, tried and true SIM system that's been around forever. But the goal there is to be able to pull it all together so that I can analyze and correlate this, all these pieces of information across my network. I can also look for trends. I can also kind of do some forecasting. So I get a lot of value from a SIM system on the network. That's a detective control. So, you know, it's another type of control that we can implement. We'll look at those tomorrow in more depth. All right, as well as external sources. Watch the news. Every day there's a new attack. You know, sometimes it's buried on page 23 of the paper or, you know, you have to click 18 times to get to it with your digital media sources. But every day, someone's being compromised somewhere. Due diligence. Stay knowledgeable of trends with computer threats, with compromises, particularly within your own industry or in environments that may have comparable assets or comparable systems. There are certainly numerous external organizations that publish information about threats. Um, CERT, MITRE, OWASP, there are a lot of agencies and organizations that are out there. Um, you can look to third-party security organizations or third-party publishing. You can have, in, you know, uh, external assessments, third-party assessments of your own environment. Look to laws and regulations. Usually they're a little bit behind the times though, right? A lot of times regulations take a while to catch up. But the point is, in order to effectively manage risk, you have to be able to identify them. In order to be able to identify risk, you have to use due diligence. So you have to make yourself knowledgeable and educated. That's what due diligence is all about. So oh, that is domain two. That is the incredible and fabulous world of risk management. So again, this is not a flashcard chapter where you've got 50 flashcards going, oh, I gotta memorize this, gotta memorize this, gotta memorize this. This is a chapter where it's really important that you understand the place of risk management in relation to cybersecurity decisions. You have to look at what you're protecting and what it's worth. You have to think of the threats and vulnerabilities that would allow a compromise. How likely are they to exploit your weaknesses? What's the impact if they do? What's the total value of loss potential versus the cost of your countermeasure and how effective your countermeasure is? I need to choose my risk responses based on the potential for loss. So my risk responses will allow me to mitigate or transfer or accept risks and bring residual risks down to the degree that's acceptable by leadership. I need to continue to monitor risk and communicate the results of monitoring to the appropriate parties in the appropriate format in the appropriate time. And that's what we've talked about today. Understanding, much more important than memorizing how 80, 800-30 is different from 839, 800-37. Get, I would know a snippet about each. 800-39 is the three-tiered approach. 800-30 is the steps for risk assessment. 837 is the risk management framework for secure system development. That's as deep as you need to go in that. But I would go back and look at them for context, for understanding. Not that they're gonna say, use the NIST 830 framework to um, you know, tell me what the stages of the NIST 830 framework are, but what's the flow? Understanding, we identify our resources, um, Again, we follow that process for assessment. Determine their value, respond, and monitor. Okay, now, um, let's see. 
These sessions will be available for on-demand viewing uh, and streaming on YouTube and LinkedIn. And I also want to mention just a couple of other things, just a commercial before you go. Don't forget that when you're preparing for this certification or any other certification, Cybrary has a lot of resources that can help you reach your goals. So we do the live streaming of our courses and we kind of get to the meat of the material in these live streams. But Cybrary On Demand also offers uh, review questions, offers flashcards associated with your topic, um, with many of the uh, exam preparation tools we have. We also offer labs that are available. So Cybrary On Demand has a ton of resources for you. Uh, we'll be conducting these live streams from time to time, most likely. We don't have any schedule or anything like that set up yet. We're doing some trial and error here, trying to find out what's most useful to you guys in the community, what you like, what you need, what works best for you. So uh, we're still in the early stages, but uh, on demand with Cybrary, which is a subscription function, is going to give you a lot more resources than just you know, a, a daily lecture on the highlights of each chapter. All right, so listen, believe it or not, we are finished with domain one and two. By my calculation, that puts us halfway through the SISM material because we are awesome, that's why. So, remember, often after class, folks will go and say, oh, I wish I'd asked her this. Write down your, your questions if you didn't get to answer, ask them. Certainly, I'll take time first thing in tomorrow to see if there were any questions we didn't get to answer for today. But we're going to wrap things up. And as always, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your attention. Tomorrow, day three, is on the Information Security Program. This is where we get the how to everything that we've talked about. Governance says these are our goals. Risk management says, okay, we've got to consider how we're going to mitigate based on cost benefit. Well, with our information security program, this is where it comes to life. This is where we look at the controls available to us, policies, procedures, standards, guidelines, and specifically administrative, technical, physical controls, and how those all work together to keep our risk profile where we want it to be. Okay, so tomorrow is a great day, lots of good information. Hope to see you back then. All right, everybody, have a fantastic day. Hope this was helpful to you, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.